Hey everybody, Quantum here, and in this video we're going to be breaking down the evolution of Emerald Amethyst Aggro Control. This is the deck pioneered by Artabax basically since the start of Azerite Sea. He's been using this in the LCCC, uh, he won a big tournament with it, other people have picked this deck up and won big tournaments with it and done very well. If you've played this deck or played against it, you know how strong it can be. So what we're going to do in this video is break down the deck list, talk through some of the card choices, and some of the changes that we've made from the original list. What I will say is, you know, Artabax is definitely the master of this list. Uh, he's obviously been a very good and very um, long-standing green and purple player and he's probably the best player in the world with this deck but that being said I think he would also admit and and you know just know that you would have to adapt your list as you move through a metagame you shouldn't really be sticking to a static list throughout the entirety of a meta because things change so we're going to discuss some of those changes here in the deck profile you can see that on the cost curve we're quite saturated in the one to three cost uh, slot a couple of four drops, five drops, and then just tapering off with seven drops. We have a total of 15 uninkables and 46 inkables for 61 total cards, all of which are characters, which makes this deck very good into Daisy Duck, by the way, the, uh, the amber one. They almost never want to play that against you, and it's uninkable, so they have to, uh, which is very good for you because you'll hit every time off Daisy if they quest with it. Getting on to the actual cards that were being used, here we got 14 one drops, 3 Chernobog followers, 4 Diablo, 3 Clarabelle, and 4 Cursed Merfolk. This is a very diverse and very powerful pool of one drops. Uh, all of them do something, right? They're not just vanillas. The Chernobog followers and Diablo replaces themselves, and these are good cards both on the play and on the drop. The Clarabelle, usually the card you do not want to play on turn 1, but if you have to, if you have nothing else, then obviously you can. But this card has some utility, obviously being a shift target as well as utilizing its kicker ability to really disrupt some of the control decks that you might face as you get into the mid to late game. Things like Sapphire, Ruby, and things like that. Hopefully popping something significant like a dime or even just an item for Hiram to prevent the quest and the draw. Next up, the Curse Merfolk is probably your best one drop, especially when you're on the play. In certain matchups, again, you will want to favor certain things over another, but generally Curse Merfolk early game is very, very strong. Stronger than it is in the late game where it can be dealt with a little bit easier other than being challenged, but getting ahead with the Curse Merfolk, forcing out a challenge so that you can pull a card from the opponent's hand can be very beneficial. In the two drop slot, we are playing a very meaningful card in the Bonsai here. This is a two cost uninkable. And the reason why this is significant is for two main reasons, mainly okay. against Ruby Amethyst, and that being that this card basically trades out for Mim Fox, which is very positive, and it helps you contest the Flynn Rider in Ruby a little bit. Um, so it's very good for those reasons. Obviously being a two quester is also very powerful. So just a really great statted card overall. The uninkability doesn't really matter because you probably never want to ink this anyways. It's always, well, I mean, you can't because it's uninkable, but you'd always want to play it regardless. Next up, um, Artabax's list ran one gazelle, but in testing, I think, and again, if you know, you don't have to take my word for it, uh, check out his updated lists and or other people or your own testing. I think you'll find that gazelle is a lot better than people thought originally. Um, the ability to give evasive until the start of your next turn can be used both offensively and defensively. Of course, this card is contingent upon you having a target for it, but the reason this is significant is because you can give something like your Mim Fox, your uh, Merlin Goat, um, your bell if you're playing that or, or anything else really something that you boost it up with crap you can give it evasive which makes it an offensive threat to take out something like a diablo on a cove can take out a maui shark that's exerted etc um very very strong but also on the defensive end you can give something like your bonsai evasive until the start of your next turn so when you quest with bonsai you know that it can't be challenged by something unless it has evasive on the opponent's end which is unlikely meaning that next turn you'll be able to quest for two with this again so the gazelle very very strong card to be used in those scenarios and i think at least a two of is is probably warranted here i did cut the peter pan shadow because again i just think gazelle is, is stronger you're constantly playing characters you're, you're nothing but characters so you should always have a target for gazelle meaning that you should always be able to threaten a diablo if it's played over just having a peter pan shadow um, again, it doesn't always work out like that because obviously Peter Pan is in and of itself just a one card take out the shadow. You, I don't need to have another threat on board in order to just try to get over the, the, the Diablo. That being said though, it's uninkable and you have to play it and in other matchups it's an absolutely terrible card to use. Next up we've got three times Gogo Tamago. Obviously I've talked about this card quite a bit being the best Emerald card out of um, Azure at Sea for sure. Uh, even though Gazelle is also very good. But the reason that you're only playing 3 and not 4 is because this card is not really what you want to play on 2, obviously. You definitely want to play this in the mid to end game. And this card is more than just a closer. It's more than just, oh, let me get the last 3 or 4 lore to win the game. As we know with Amethyst decks, 
you really only need to get to 16-ish lore. And once you get to 16-ish lore, you're starting to threaten Goat Bounce. You're, th you're starting to threaten now uh, White Rose to just gain lore without questing. So even if your opponent is constantly removing your threats, you're like, well, let me just put a Goat on board. That's two lore. Let me play a White Rose. That's one lore. I just close out the game that way. I don't necessarily need to quest. So Gogo can also help you close the gap. If you're in a dicey situation where you're like, ah, I couldn't really get a lot going. I only got to like 13 lore. My opponent is now starting to lock down the board. If you just Gogo out of nowhere for like four damage um, or four lore, you can go up to like 16, 17 lore. And then you're like, now I'm just back in the game. Now I am I can play out my hand, threaten everything, just get a go, just get a White Rose, and I'm good to go. And this deck draws a lot of cards, which we'll talk about as well. Um, so it's not really that big of a deal to overextend with this deck, which is kind of crazy and why it's so powerful. Next up, we've got four Ursula Deceiver. There was a time where I was considering cutting this card from Emerald Lists uh, because songs have really been uh, cut back in a lot of decks. That being said, though, it still has tremendous value. Steel Song is still around, still a powerful deck, and one of the decks that does give Emerald Amethyst some trouble, So, especially if they're playing Calhoun, which usually they're not, though. Uh, but this card still has some value. Um, we're, we're seeing Ruby Sapphire go back to how far all goes and plays with Fishbone Quill, so you know this card still has utility uh, to be played. Next up, you've got Madame Mim Fox. No need to explain this. The best Amethyst card, probably, um, still. <laughs> And four crabs. So Artabax was also on four crabs. I talked about this in my other Amethyst decks about how useful crab is right now in the meta. Basically, right now, we're in a genie meta in my opinion. We're in a genie meta because there are three primary decks that use genie as their, I don't want to say win condition, but as a large facilitator of their game plan. We've seen Amethyst Steel really come to the forefront in, as a tier, basically like a tier 1, tier 1.5 deck. Obviously, Emerald Amethyst here and Ruby Amethyst. They all use Genie. They all use it to great effect. And it's almost like what Minnie Mouse was in set two for Ruby Amethyst when that was, you know, everywhere. Everyone was either playing Ruby Amethyst or Steel Song. Um, and majority of people were playing Ruby Amethyst. It was like a, basically a tier zero format. But basically, the reason why Crab is so important is because the Challenger plus three can really help give your Genie the boost to run over an opponent's Genie or give another evasive threat like even the Go-Go or something the uh, challenger three so even if you have to play gogo -Go on two you know you might be like well it's not that bad because i'm expecting the genie and so i can set this up now so i can crab it later and the opponent can't deal with this until they have an evasive threat like no one's really going to brawl a two two um that quest for one right if you're in like a ruby amethyst matchup for example uh moving on though we've got white rose so this one the white rose is a good card but it is a little underwhelming the, obviously the goat is just better um, but being a 3-3 body for 3 that gains you a lore on play isn't necessarily bad. Again, there are some cool things you can do with it, like crab it to make it a 6-3, run over a big threat. Um, but in general, you know, you might want to cut this to 2. Um, again, it's never going to be like bad. It's really just a question of uh, are there better things to play in place of it. And, um, you know, again, I'm on 61 cards already. So if I was going to cut one card from this list to make it an even 60, it would probably be the White Rose. Next up, we've got Kick Cloud Kicker. You could play four of this. I think Artabax was on four. Um, but again, sometimes this card can be very limited with what it can do. It's obviously very good into certain matchups, but, you know, into those, I don't want to say strength-based decks, but the decks that do have um, characters with a lot of strength, like this card is just not going to do anything. I think, I'm thinking mainly of, like, going up against opposing Gontus. Um, the new 4-3 body that quest for four. Um, you know, again, in, in certain matchups, this card like will be good and will, will have a lot of value but in other matchups like you're just like I, I don't want to bounce anything like I don't want to bounce your rabbit in a ruby amethyst match like yeah I can bounce maybe like a Flynn Rider um, but aside from that like you know bouncing a Chernobyl followers is meaningless bouncing a magic broom is meaningless so you know it has it has good use but definitely something that I think three would be a, a better ratio than four um, again, at worst it's ink, but you don't want to get clogged up with too many of these in your hand is basically what I'm trying to say. So that's why I like running two to three of the cards that I want to see them sometimes, but I don't want to see multiples of them at once. Like Genie, I don't mind seeing multiples at once. Despite it being an uninkable, I, I know that like, I'm going to play Genie and then next time I'm going to play Genie again, right? Most likely, depending on, again on the matchup and what my opponent might have for removal. Um, but yeah, this is a four cost uninkable two, four body that quests for two and replaces itself. So the card has steadily increased significant, well, steadily increased in price to a significant amount now. It started off at pre-orders at five bucks. I don't remember what the foils pre-orders were. I think they were 15. Um, 
but yeah they have uh, 15 canadian by the way so this is like almost double since uh it came out but every like i was just telling you guys like the reason it's so expensive is because every deck is running it every deck that's amethyst is running genie so we are basically in a genie meta um yes there are decks that don't play amethyst that are meta like emerald steel still um sapphire ruby that kind of thing uh, amber steel but they all need answers to genie when you're building those decks you need answers to genie because you're going to go up against amethyst right the lccc has proved that as well uh four goats no need to explain this right um still the goat card as well fox and goat man Wow. <laughs> uh, still on three rabbits. Uh, and this is where the deck can really afford to play very aggressive in the early game. So when I call this aggro control, your aggro in the start with your excessive one to three drops, then you start aiming for a control oriented game as you get to four, five, six. Um, you can play aggressive because you know as soon as you start dropping genies and merlins, you're refilling your hand. And even if these get exhausted, like you play the rabbit and you don't bounce it back because you're not playing snakes, um, because and I can explain that in just a bit, but you're not playing snakes, be, um, so you can't protect the rabbit all the time like you do with Ruby Amethyst. You're really only playing Fox. So when you play a rabbit, there's a good chance that you play this and it's going to get outed at some point, but it still represents a draw two. However, it doesn't represent a draw eight like it can in, in Ruby Amethyst. So you're eventually going to run out of gas, right? You're going to you're not going to see all of the rabbits, you're not going to see all the genies, but you just need to see a couple to keep the engine rolling, to just keep dropping threats, and you're putting your opponent on either I'm questing and you're removing it or you're trying to remove it you're spending your turns removing my threats you're not developing your own board and that's why a deck like this can be so strong you don't play snake because you don't really want to lose that tempo I don't want to bounce a followers of Diablo or a merfolk I'd only really want to bounce a Clarabelle I'd rather just develop an actual threat um, you know an Ursula isn't really a threat but potentially pulling a card is good gazelling a merfolk for an extra quest two is good uh, that's protection mainly though dropping a bonsai onto is what you want and Snake, while it is a good card still, like I don't want I'd rather just keep the Chernobog and the Diablo on board or get the utility of them drawing, right? Um, so and that's in my opinion why you don't want to go with Snake. But you know, you are playing goats, you are playing crabs, and you are playing rabbits. So there is a, there is a world where Snake is useful. Maybe you play two or three copies of it. I don't think four, but because it, it's not what your turn two wants to be, but later on using the snake as bounces is, is good. Um, but again, the reason why this deck can be so powerful is, is basically what you saw with, Ar again, if you watched Artabax's match against Ruby Amethyst, I was talking to my friend during that match, um, and the way that Artabax was able to use the genies and the rabbits, I mean, to be fair, he did draw into like, you know, the cards he needed to see, but a deck like this is going to do that because you can constantly put a ton of pressure on your opponent and you don't even care about getting board wiped. Because, again, Genie gets board wiped, it replaced itself. Rabbit gets board wiped, it drew two. So you can aggressively play these cards out and put the pressure on your opponent. Um, because your fallback plan is Clarabelle. And into control matchups, Clarabelle will win you the game. As you saw, again, if you watch those, um, if you watch Artabax's match against Noimnot, who was on Ruby Amethyst. I think he dropped he dropped a Clarabelle after the B prepared and drew six or five or something like that. Or he had the potential to draw six, but he drew like five, like I'm pretty sure it was five cards. Um, and as soon as that happened, I told my friend, I was like, yeah, that's just like, you know, he's, he's holding on this Clarabelle. He's, that, this, this Clarabelle is going to win him the game. He started off missing his one drop. Um, he had a very weak start and it looked like Noimnot was just going to run away with the game. And I messaged my friend and I'm like, if he, because he won, he almost won game two on the back of Clarabelle. And I messaged my friend and I said, if he draws, or did he win? I forget what it was. He either, yeah, I think, I think he won one of the games just by being aggro. And he may have come close to winning another one because of the Clarabelle. But then he definitely won game three because of Clarabelle. Um, and I remember telling my friend, like, the, the only way Artifacts can come back from this bad start in game three is if he Clarabelles into advantage because, and that's exactly what he did. Because Artabax having the weak start in that matchup um, obviously didn't get him to the place he wanted to be by the mid-game. So he wasn't pressuring a lot of lore to be able to close the game out before Ruby Amethyst starts locking down the board. And he couldn't o really overextend because um, Noimnot had the Flynn into Sisu line, which was very powerful against a deck like this, right? Because the big Sisu checks your bonsai i think artifacts played a bonsai and like couldn't quest with it because he's like it just gets i just lose it to the to the sisu it's just like bad this is like a negative card advantage and i can't really claw that back right now but then as soon as he picked up this clarabelle which he's only playing two of in his list 
Um, and I've opted to three here. You can even argue to go to four. But um, as soon as he drew that Clarabelle, he was like, oh, now I can start to overextend. Because Noimnot is playing the control game. He's cycling his rabbits. He's drawing cards with Genie. He had six cards in his hand. And Artabax just extended, just played out, started questing, doing a bunch of things. And the board got so wide and overwhelming that Noimnot eventually had to be prepared. Because Artabax did a couple of things, right? He did, a, he did a combination of, I'm going to remove some of your threats. I'm going to keep my threats on board. So I'm going to force you into a position where you have to be prepared in order to slow me down. And when Noimnot did be prepared, then he uh, Artabax had one card left in his hand. He drew for turn, which I think was a Tamago, and then he dropped Clarabelle. He could have inked the Tamago, but I think he was so far ahead in the lore, he was banking on the Tamago being the closer for him. Um, so he did not ink the the Tamago, because if he did ink it, I think he would have drawn six, but he drew five instead. But imagine getting be prepared, and your opponent has one card left in hand, and then or, or be preparing, and your opponent has one card in hand, and you have like six, and you're like, yeah, I'm good now. right? Pass back to you, you play one card, or you know you draw you might play two cards because you're gonna draw for turn, and then your opponent slams the Clarabelle and draws six. Now you have to be like I have to answer this Clarabelle. I have six cards in my hand. I have to answer this Clarabelle, and I have to somehow develop my own, like redevelop my own board because I just be prepared. It's like it's not happening. And then they just drew six, and they're the aggro deck, so they're just gonna drop a bunch of threats again. And it's like you just need constant be prepared in order to keep checking their board. And then at that point, it's still probably not enough because I told my friend, I said, I, I don't think he's gone through any goats or any foxes or any uh, white roses. And I believe Artabax ended up closing out the game with the fox, or uh, sorry, with the goat and the right rose because he drew into them off of that, like draw six. It was just insane. So that's what a deck like this can kind of do and why it's so powerful. Um, Artabax was not on Bell, but this is an interesting tech option because, again, when you look at the, the genie meta air quotes, Imagine, you know, genie versus genie. You throw your genie into their genie or they throw their genie into your genie, whatever. Each genie only has two damage. Now you play a bell and you're like, let me move two damage from my genie to your genie. My genie's healed and your genie gets banished and I have a bell and a genie. Pretty good. Um, bell is also good at moving damage around to just anything, right? Hit something with Tamago, next turn bell it. That's pretty good value. Moved counters to a Diablo, it's pretty good value. Right, move counters to a Maui Shark that's already been damaged. That's pretty good value, right? So Bell, I think, definitely has some utility in a deck like this. Uh, um, another nice thing is you can also use it with Clarabelle, right? So Clarabelle being a huge 5-6 body, move damage off of Clarabelle in into something else, right? So D Clarabelle can be used as a sweeper almost. Um, and then, of course, for Elsa. There was some consideration of cutting this from the deck, but this is, I, I really do think you need to keep the Elsa. Just because in certain scenarios you do need to force exertions and and control board states, uh, and that's the nice thing about Amethyst is you have the you have natural aggro aspects, but you also have the nice curve out into control cards as well. Like you can go aggro in the beginning and then curve out to let me manage the board state because I'm not hyper aggro. We know that there is a weakness with hyper aggro. A more tempo oriented aggro control strategy like this um curves out so perfectly well and the elsa fits that strategy it's why the card is still worth a decent amount despite being a starter deck card it's very good um and yeah this is another card that works with crap so you drop this exert something um you can crab crash boost this or next turn drop crab and then you have a five five evasive that can basically take out anything right it's it's insane how much power creep not power creep but like you know i'm just thinking like five five evasive that's like mickey mouse from uh uh, the first chapter, right? The Brave Little Tailor. Just imagine getting Elsa with Crabbed on your big little tailor that you spent eight to develop and had to wait a turn to quest. For four, uh, be it, but... Um, anyways, that's the deck list. The Clarabelle, I've already kind of explained the significance of it. This is a card played very strategically. You hold this. Um, it's come down quite a bit in price. I mean, I would be picking up my copies if I didn't have this already. Um, that's just me though. Very good card still and will continue to see a lot of use in different ink pairings. One of the strongest Emerald cards for sure. Okay, this is a long deck profile. Uh, let me know again if you've enjoyed this. Um, it incentivizes me to continue to post more for you guys. If you made it this far, again, thank you for watching. Um, let me know what you think in the comment section below. And make sure you drop a like as well. Quantum is out.